Well, good afternoon. Saturday afternoon. Actually, about 5 o'clock in the evening. I just decided to um, relax and not um, do my filming in the morning. And just take the day to do some meditations on and off, 20 minutes all day today. And uh, really, um, I keep emphasizing that meditation is simply the act of sitting still, being at peace. And while we are in the act of being at peace without any stimulation, we are able to look at some of the things that are going on inside of us that tend to um, make it difficult to stay in, in a state of peacefulness. I mean, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Um, the inner negative voices and negative thoughts that kind of go on. And um, they become very noticeable when we're quiet. But the interesting thing is, is that um, these things do go on. Sorry, honey. These things do go on um, even when we're not meditating when we're at work, or when we're getting groceries, or any of these types of things, that that uh, these disturbances to our peacefulness are not only disturbing our meditation, they're disturbing our life. And really, this is what the Buddha was trying to point a figure at, was that um, we are not in a state of internal peacefulness very often. <laughs> And when when we run our life from our thoughts, these negative or uh, they're not negative, they're narrow, narrow thinking uh, leads to narrow actions. That leads to building narrow lifestyles, narrow lives. Uh, we build narrow businesses and narrow marriages, and uh, and none of them really bring the satisfaction that. Uh, comes from just being at peace, truly at peace, not searching for anything at all. So the Buddha was encouraging us to let go of this constant need to search. I remember one of my Buddhist teachers pointed to the ants one day and says, look at what are they doing? I said, I don't know, they look like they're searching for something, you know, they're just running around looking for stuff. And he says the ants never stop searching, right? And he said that people were not a whole lot different. So with meditation, yesterday we talked a little bit. I was going to do uh, show you um, uh, the chakra um, balancing, but I'm going to wait for another time for that. Just uh, I got a dog on my knee and it makes it a little more difficult uh, to do that. But, but the the way that we find peacefulness through meditation is is we listen. We listen to these aspects within us that are causing kind of turmoil and we begin to work with that. It's no different than working with uh, a difficult child or working with a difficult, um, you know, any, anything, difficult anything that we work, we can, we can decide how we're going to handle that. So we had a difficult child, we could try discipline, we could try yelling, we could try forcing, we could try many, many different things, um, but none of those uh, create a child who is peaceful and uh, kind of uh, balanced, uh, you know, they usually cause a reprisal when we start acting in that way. So these are the choices that we have in meditation, really, with at all times. These are the choices that we have on how we're going to handle situation. And, uh, you know, meditation allows us to test all those things out on ourselves instead of on our family or on our friends and on our wives and husbands. Um, but as time goes on, we'll begin to realize that that truly, you know, when we're dealing with these aspects of our consciousness that are hurt or scared or fearful or rebellious, um, that it's that the best way to deal with them is first to seek no is to seek nothing from that. Realize that this is an aspect of our personality or of our consciousness that is in a weakened state, in a sense. So the suggestions that it's making. The fight that it's giving us is almost like it's due to being, a, a view of imbalance is almost like an illness. It's like it's not feeling that well. We're not feeling that well. <laughs> and, and you know how it is, when we're not feeling that well, we act exactly that way. We're imbalanced, we're quick-tempered, all these types of things. 
So these aspects of our consciousness are, are not feeling that well. They're imbalanced. So because we seek nothing from their, their discourse, we seek nothing from, their, from what they're saying to us, we're not affected by it. You know, like a sick child, or you know, sometimes I look at it as the inner mind, sometimes as, a, as, as um, someone who has addictions, someone who is addicted and is in the midst of an addiction, they say the worst things. But really, they love us. They just love the drug more, right? And these aspects are the same way. You know, they, they love all the things that we love in the present. It's just that this aspect loves uh, um, something more. Like say, for example, we're having problems with a part of our consciousness that wants to get up and watch TV. He loves, that part of me loves yoga, or loves Qigong or loves meditation. But at this moment, that part wants to watch a movie instead. Want, it loves that part more, right? And so we can't really cast these characters as negative or terrible beings because it's us, but it's us searching. And when we're searching, it puts us into a state of mind that's, that's what I call a lower state of mind. Think of it this way for a second. This is the complete consciousness that we are. When we're not searching for anything, balance is, is a balance of our, just our understanding. It is the balance of all the things that we know. Right? But as soon as we become an energy that's searching, our balance is not all the things that we know. Our balance is, is, uh, is getting the thing that we're searching for. So our balance changes. When we begin to search for something, our balance is, our, our goal is to get that thing. And for that reason, all other things now are in the way of that goal. Things like yoga, qigong, meditation, right? So what happens is it changes our frame of mind. Searching diminishes some things and puts, puts a strong emphasis on the thing that we're searching for. And because of that, it leads to imbalanced actions, right? Um, so part of what we're doing is we're, real, is we're trying to discount that information that's coming to us in that imbalanced way. We listen, but then we just let it go because this is an about state, it's a lower state of mind. And the highest state of mind is when we are searching for nothing. Because then we are not, we're, we're, not, being we're not being pushed to the left or pushed to the right uh, in any way. Uh, we are instead um, simply standing still, standing still or sitting still in calmness. You know, I was on a journey from probably the age of seven. A journey I didn't even know I was even on. And this is how I began to, um, this is how I first discovered um, the purpose of meditation in a sense. So I spent many years meditating, trying to kind of use it as a break, you know, kind of learning how to find peacefulness or about kind of quietness um, at first I was looking for silence in common a way because I, I was equating peace silence uh, quietness with silence when really it, quietness is with peacefulness so we're not looking for quietness as in be quiet we're looking for the the to be at such a state of understanding that we are not roused to questioning we're not we're just at peace we're calm right we're not being constantly dragged this way or this way because of our neediness. But anyways, very young in my life, so grade seven, that would be, or grade seven, uh, age seven, that would be maybe grade two or three. So I fell in love with a girl. I don't even remember her name. <laughs> Didn't work out very well. <laughs> and um, and uh, I remember I was at home, a young, young kid. I mean, bunk beds, my brother and I, Got a piece of paper, write, write a little, little love note and pencil, and I think I folded it up and put it in her desk early in the morning. I thought it was great, you know. I thought, you know, maybe we'll get together, have lunch, to peanut butter sandwiches together, play outside. You know, normal stuff. Kid stuff. But anyways, the teacher found the note and hung it up on the board. I read it to the class and really put me in a spot where I was very embarrassed. And... Uh, you know, I began to realize something about people. All people are sensitive. All people.
people are sensitive. Rule number one. If you've been through any trouble, you are hypersensitive. <laughs> Which accounts for most of us again, right? We're hypersensitive. So we have to really be careful how we handle people. But anyways, this teacher didn't handle me very well. And I didn't handle it very well at all either because I was so sensitive. And um, from that moment on, I began a journey of trying to be safe. I was so embarrassed. I was, I, I think I blamed it on my brother. Uh, you know, we, uh, I, uh, but immediately I began to withdraw. I never talked to uh, girls very much after that for a long time. I certainly um, did not put myself out at all because it was dangerous. If I put myself out, it was a chance I would be embarrassed and I would be put in front of a crowd and embarrassed. So none of that. So for, from that age on, I stood back, I didn't go to any dances. I didn't even go to my graduation. I, I didn't, didn't go to, didn't do anything. I, I can't remember hardly any friends back then at all because I just stayed back. I went to school, I did my stuff, went back home. So this went on for years, you know, until I was in my 40s. And, um, and I didn't realize it, but I was on a journey of self-protection that started at the age of seven. And, and you don't realize how much damage that does to you uh, until you begin to realize what you're doing. You were at peace. The world was before me, before us. But now I've been sent on a journey by an event. This woman embarrassed me, off on a journey. And I, I, I one of being protected. I took jobs, I you know, had all sorts of things going on in my life, I got married, you know, but as soon as any event in my life with my job or my marriage or for anything with bit you know, made me feel like I was uh, in danger, my primary my primary um, journey was of self protection. So when I had a choice between the job and self protection, I got rid of the job. If the journey was between my marriage and self-protection, I got rid of my marriage, right? And I did get rid of my marriage, you know, for that reason too. And so we start really realizing it, I was already on a journey. And because of that, any, any relationships I was making while on that journey were subject to meeting that journey's requirements in a sense. And we're all on journeys like that. Now, when you realize that you're on two or three journeys like that in a way, two or three ways of thinking, or hundreds of ways of thinking, all these things kind of crossing each other, you begin to realize where all this conflict comes from. But anyway, so one day I'm meditating and I'm being real quiet and this, this story keeps coming up about this girl. I mean, this is like a long time ago and, and about how it changed me and, and, and I was trying to find peace through like a break. So I'm like, quiet, quiet, I'm, I'm trying to meditate. Nobody, nobody. And, um, and, uh, so I'm pushing it aside, not dealing with it, I'm quieting it. And then, and then uh, one day I thought, you know what, it's kind of weird this keeps coming up, maybe I should deal with it. And so I decided that time, or the next time in meditation, I would deal with it. So when meditation came, and I started meditating, and, and then finally I said, hold on a second, come here, come here. Let's talk about this situation that keeps coming up. And I, I, I instinctively asked for like a young boy to come forward. And now I know why, because I realized that when we begin the journey, it wasn't a, a man that began the journey, it was a boy. A boy at a boy's emotional state, a boy at a boy's sensitivity that was now on a journey of, secure, of, of safety, of being protective of himself. And so that boy had never moved from that. So I was dealing with a, with a part of my conscious that was very young. Um, and uh, and so I said, come here for a second. You know, let's talk about this again. I mean, what did we do? We wrote a letter to this little girl. We had good intentions. We were hoping just to share peanut butter and jam sandwiches. I mean, we were seven. So there was not a, nothing go bad going on there. And and the teacher embarrassed us and that sort of thing. But now let's look at it. Like, what did, we, did we do something wrong there, really? And, and, and then I started thinking, you know something, I'm proud of that little boy. You know, that little boy just loved a little girl and wanted to have some, some fun, you know, enjoy uh, sandwiches with, you know, like it was a beautiful thing. Uh, and, um, and it's just a boy showing love. So I thought, you know, this, this, I'm going to be, I'm proud of that part of me for doing that. And as far as the teacher goes, 
first I was mad at her, but then I started realizing it, you know? Like, I was mad at my parents for a long time because I thought they were silly, and then I realized they were kids when they had me. <laughs> you know, and then I started thinking the teacher was probably the same way. She was probably 22 years of age, or who knows? Or it doesn't matter what her age was. Her emotional age may have been very young, and she just wasn't really, you know, uh, uh, kind of equipped to deal with such a thing in a simple way, but she overreacted. But I forgave her because I thought, you know, like she's just a kid learning too, so who cares, right? And as soon as I let go of that event, I changed my way of seeing it. Do you understand? Because I, she didn't harm me. I harmed myself because of how I saw it. And as soon as I changed the way I saw this, that whole section of my personality that was connected with self-protection, with being quiet, with being, with being kind of nervous, all just kind of fell away because it wasn't even me. It was me protecting myself. It was me in a protective state. It was me on an existing journey. And as soon as I put that journey to rest, I became me. I became my the original me again. The me that I lost at age seven was still there. It was still busy <laughs> protecting himself. So we brought it back and I realized that all the aspects of my personality that were, were, were affected by that event disappeared in a second, in a split second. And I returned back to being calm and easy going, relaxed. And then I realized that I had just untied an emotional knot that was holding me in place, right? And that this was the purpose of meditation. So I invite you to try this. I mean, you know, do it for fun, do it for relaxation because, because I mean, we take things so seriously, but don't, just relax. Enjoy the process of untying these little knots that naturally get there because we get things happen to us when we're young. We don't know everything. We don't know what to do. So we make these little decisions, but we can go back one by one and make them again because we are not held back. This is the beautiful part about this thing. It shows us that we are not broken. We have adjusted ourselves in such a way that we're not being as successful as we want to be. But we did it to ourselves, which is perfect because we are the only ones that can that can fix it by going back to these events. That we do not, we cannot be broken by somebody else. Which means that all the cure is within these palms. We can fix everything by just looking at it and by working with it. Anyways, enough. I've gone a little longer than I usually want to on this talk. But again, please, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, and if not, I hope you enjoy this series. And I invite you to subscribe to this channel and uh, enjoy it. Anyways, thanks again. I appreciate it. The little puppy's all bitey today. I don't know if you're white. <laughs> Anyways, uh, we thank you again very much. Thank you.